Hey, what's up there? Brian Goulet here at GouletBenz.com, and it is episode number 189 of Goulet Q&A. And uh, literally, as I'm sitting here shooting, I'm watching this truck out there that's like grinding stumps and chewing up all kinds of brush. So if it's a little bit noisy in the background, uh, that is why. But anyway, um, so I got some cool stuff to talk about today. Fancy pens, which brands have the best QC, pen trends that are on the horizon and so on. It's gonna be a good time. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna say happy fountain pen day. Today, as when this video is publishing anyway, is Friday, November 3rd, and it is Fountain Pen Day. So officially the first fountain, uh, sorry, officially the first Friday of every November is Fountain Pen Day. And it's really cool because it's something that came up grassroots through the community. I believe this is the fifth year that it's happened. Um, and it's just a really cool thing that goes on. So we've got all kinds of deals running for today only. Um, hopefully you've already seen them uh, by the time you watch this video, but uh, maybe not if you haven't, and it's still Friday, go check those out because um, we got some deals on our site. Um, uh, but otherwise, I just hope you have a good day and get to enjoy some time with your fountain pens today. Uh, okay, so I've been on my special diet. I won't talk about that. I talked about it way too much last week, um, but uh, I'm, I'm chugging along. I'm uh, you know, taking certain supplements and, and um, you know, on this very restricted diet that's kind of fit for me personally. I'm um, trying to work this stuff out of my system. Uh, and it's been in a bit of an adjustment. I have not been exercising quite as much just because my energy has been lower. Uh, but I feel like I'm starting to adjust a little bit, you know? And uh, so we had, we had uh, Halloween yesterday and everybody was all dressed up. Uh, yesterday as of when I'm shooting this. I'm shooting this on Wednesday. But um, we had Halloween on Tuesday. It was fun. The team all dressed up. So that was very spirit lifting. And so it's been good. I've been adjusting and, um, you know, it's been it's been good. I, I won't say it hasn't been an adjustment, but uh, it's been good. Um, some other fun things we've gotten to, to do has been um, uh, this giveaway with Jake Weidman. He engraved this special pen that I showed last week. It was awesome. As of when I'm shooting this video, we have like 35,000 entries, which is amazing. Of course, you can enter multiple times, but uh, it's a lot of people doing a lot of cool stuff, uh, sharing a lot, and which is just great because I'm a huge supporter of Jake's, uh, you know, in Monte Grappa for giving us the pen. And, uh, you know, it's just been really cool to uh, uh, be able to uh, bring this whole thing together. So we've already announced the winner at this point on a different channel. I don't yet know because I'm recording this on Wednesday who the winner is because the cons is still open as of when I'm recording this. But you can go check that out on our blog. Oh, you can hear that grinding in the background. <laughs> Um, also this week we had thanks giveaway that started, which is really cool because this is something that we've been doing uh, for about five years now. So we have some sweet prizes. Stipula Etruria Prisma 88 Rainbow, Pelican M400 Tortoise Brown, Pilot Vanishing Point Crimson Sunrise, which you can't get anymore. Uh, Edison Nouveau Premier Delphinium, which can't get anymore. Lamy 2000 Gift Set, Twisby 580 All Turquoise with a bottle of Lamy Petrol. Really good stuff. We've been saving up some of this stuff specifically for Thanks Giveaway Giveaway. Uh, thanks Giveaway Giveaway. How about that? I just said it twice and just rolled off the tongue. But uh, it's really cool. You can check out our blog and see the rules to enter. Um, you know, this is something that we started out doing five years ago because, you know, uh, there's such a big push for just promotional stuff and all this attention with all this, not just e-commerce, but brick and mortar stores and just retail in general. Everybody's trying to get you to buy stuff around this time, right? And it's all sales and this and the other. And we do that, we do that stuff too. You know, we're a business like anybody else, but we thought it'd be really cool kind of leading up to the holiday season to do something uh, really as a special way to say thank you. Um, it's, a, it's part of our expression, express gratitude value that we have as a core value of ours at GUI Pens. And uh, it's just a really cool thing that we like to do. And it's, it's kind of grown and evolved over the years. Uh, the first time we did it, we had a contest portion and we, we've evolved uh, a little bit. Uh, but something very different that we're doing this year um, that's a change from last year is instead of having you all handwrite letters and mail it to us like we had last year, we ended up with about 1,700 letters a little bit over that, I think. And it was entirely overwhelming. And it's like at the busiest time of year when things are crazy for us anyway. Um, so we just felt like we weren't able to really, you know, just give them all justice. And we definitely couldn't take the time to respond to every one of you and all that. But um, we thought, you know, maybe we could maintain the same spirit of that, still enjoy the use of fountain pens, promote writing and all that kind of stuff and expressing gratitude. But rather than you all sending us the letters, you can pick somebody very meaningful in your life and send the letters to that individual. Um, you know, somebody that, um, 
you know, uh, is maybe a relative of yours who means something to you or a significant other, um, somebody that uh, you know just doesn't get a lot of personal contact, you know, maybe a neighbor of yours or somebody that, uh, you know, is, is involved in, in some organization that you're in that maybe is kind of on the fringes. Just write them a letter and just kind of, um, you know, express uh, what you're thankful for and express gratitude towards them. It's, it's amazing the, the connection that you can have from one individual to another. So. That is going to be your entry into the contest this year. And then sharing that on social media, letting us know that you've done that, but then the end result is somebody else getting a letter where it might be the only letter that they've received in a decade, and it could mean everything to them. So I'm really encouraged to hear the stories that come out of that. I think it's going to be an amazing thing that comes out of Thanks Giveaway this year. And uh, it's just a flat out good pay it forward thing to do, so I'm really pumped for that. Um, so check that out. We have all the rules and everything on the blog. Um, and we're going to be running that right up until before Thanksgiving. And the nice thing about doing it this way too is like in years past we've had it be where international folks uh, have to mail us letters and it's always really stressful to see if it gets there in time. This way literally you can be like on the last day. You can write a letter, take a picture of it, mail it off, and then send it and you can submit and be entered. doesn't matter where you are in the world. So that's a really cool kind of way to go about it too. So that's kind of fun. Um, some other cool stuff that we've had going on. We have um, Goulet polishing cloths which is something that I've been excited about for a long time and I've kind of been alluding to like, oh, we're developing some future things. This is one of those future things. So for a long time, I have had a polishing cloth that I've just bought. You know, I use like a microfiber cloth, which is just kind of like, it doesn't have any polishing compound in it or anything, but it, it's helpful to clean stuff. But I have like a polishing cloth that I bought at like a jeweler and uh, it's nice and it works okay, but it's huge. Like the one that I personally have been using is enormous to the point where it's like it's too big and it's very cumbersome to use with pens. So I was looking for something a little bit smaller, something obviously it could be a little bit of branding and you know kind of put my name on would be kind of cool, but um, we were able to find these sweet blue and white polishing cloths, company colors, you know and uh, put our name on it and stuff like that, which is, you know, probably means more to me than it does to you. But anyway, something kind of cool for you, and it's nice. It's small enough to be able to carry it around with you. You can even keep it in a notebook or in a pen case or something like that. Um, you know, if you have a 12-pen case or something, you can just kind of fold it up in there nicely and fit and carry it around with you. But the nice thing about this is it's a two-stage polishing cloth. So it has kind of a jeweler's compound that's embedded in the cloth here. Um, and the white part of the cloth inside, which has multiple sides to it that you can use, so plenty of space for you. Um, all you gotta do, and I have this, this uh, Homo sapiens uh, London fog here, which has sterling silver accents. Um, you literally just kind of take that and you rub it on there, right? So it works for silver, you know, fine metals. You don't want to use it on 24 karat gold, but pretty much no pen has 24 karat gold anything because it's too soft to really use for anything. But you can polish your nibs with it, you can polish your trim, heck, you can even polish the plastic on the pens and uh, and it will get like really fine scratches. It won't get deep scratches, but it'll get fine scratches. You can see there it's like picking up some junk and uh, it's really, even just that part makes it look really good. And then the blue part, um, gets a really fine polish on it. And you just give it a couple of swirls like that. And uh, boom, that center band looks freaking incredible now. Um, so it's really nice, especially if you have anything sterling silver, but even if you have just regular trim over time, like the Homo sapiens, the Bronze Age, that thing polishes up nicely with this. So um, just kind of a cool thing. We've got it available on our site now, so you can go check that thing out. Um, we have Girologio pen cases, which we launched last week. Um, I didn't have any to really show you, but I just wanted to show you a couple of them and show you what I'm excited about with them. They're all relatively affordable. They're made in India. And, uh, uh, you know, good quality leather. I really like the way that it feels. Uh, the craftsmanship seems to be really good. It's a smaller brand. Um, they've been around for about a decade or so. So, I mean, they've been around for long enough to where I think, um, you know, they've got the stability there as far as the, the manufacturing and stuff goes. Um, but it is kind of a smaller, more speculative brand. So, um, you know, it is, it is just something new for us and new for you. Uh, but I think given the lower price point, it's going to be something exciting for a lot of you. Um, so that's kind of cool. There's some neat uh, form factors for these pen cases. Um, the ones that I like are these smaller uh, magnetic magnetic enclosure ones, a three pen case in here. It fits, you know, pretty large size pens. Pretty much all these cases I'm gonna be able to fit the largest pens I have in here um, and without much of a problem. So that's kind of nice. That one I think is 40 bucks. Then you've got a uh, 12 pen case here. This is the, uh, oh, sorry, and this one, the color of it is oxblood. It's really cool. It's this kind of deep red with a little bit of black in it. Very cool, my personal favorite. Um, just because it's different, you know, it's a nice different color. 
course you got a classic black here. This is your 12 pen case, so it's got six on each side with a flap in between. The flap covers all the pens. Pretty nice, um, nice solid loops, double loops on both sides so your pens aren't flopping everywhere. Uh, and then we got a 24 pen case too, which is uh, very similar to that one except um, it's got the flap all the way on the side so you can see all the pens in one shot. And then it's got double loops uh, going horizontally here so you can fit all the pens, all the pens. Um, all very affordable, you're looking at 50 bucks max for these pen cases, so pretty solid. Seem to be great, we're excited about it. So you can check those out all on our site. Um, some other things we've got is some Goulet holiday note cards. So these are four by six note cards um, that we have and we've put together a package set too with note cards and uh, Clairefontaine Triumph envelopes that fit the note cards too. If you wanna like do a more traditional, rather than postcard style, if you wanna actually like mail a card, you can do that. Um, the Pilot Custom Urushi that I showed you last week, which is nice and huge. Um, we had a little mix up there, you know, miscommunication. We were told they were coming in fine nib, but then when the pen came in, it actually said FM. And just, we did not notice it right away. Um, I guess we were so excited about just how big the pen was, we didn't think to check, like, the nib was slightly different. So FM is fine medium. So, um, you know, I'm working with Pilot to get understanding as to exactly how that was communicated, but uh, even still, so it's gonna be more like a kind of a traditional European fine in that fine medium uh, than the Japanese fine, but uh, we are uh, still excited about that pen. And then we have the Aurora 88 Minerali Diopside. So this is similar to the Azurite, which is the blue one, um, but this one is it's a clear pen with green accents on the top. It looks really good, I gotta say. This green looks really nice in person. Green is one of these colors that, you know, it's hard to tell exactly how it's gonna be received because some people love green, some people hate green. It really depends on the shade, but it's a really nice looking pen. Just came out on the first, so you can check that out on our site. And then um, we did finally restock the Faber-Castell Loom gunmetal uh, in the matte color. So I don't know how regularly those are gonna be available, but they were a huge hit when they first launched, and then we were out of them for like six weeks, and then we just got them back in this week. So I don't know if they'll still be around by the time this video publishes, but hopefully we'll be able to get better stock of those. Um, and then some stuff that's coming. I'm getting to the question soon, I promise. Uh, I have no specific dates for any of the stuff that's coming. I know it's kind of frustrating, but it's, it's all kind of up in the air. You know, we're being told about things here and there. Um, the Lamy Ions, I'm told very soon. It's exciting, it's worth the wait, I promise you, but I'm told in the next week or two they'll be available. So we'll see, I've been told the next week or two before, so um, I don't wanna get you too excited, but they're impending, get ready. Um, the Pelican M605 White Transparent is gonna be coming soon as well. Um, that one is kind of a question mark too, but it's I know it's on the way. Uh, Diamond Earl Grey also, a lot of people interested in that one. Um, you know, a big Reddit following, that's kind of where it came from. Um, but uh, uh, we'll have that one and I'm sure that one is gonna go quickly. Uh, and then the Aurora 88 Flex in chrome and gold. So this is basically your 88 pen um, that has like a gold and chrome plating, like real gold and chrome. It's like a plating over top of the resin. So it's gonna be an interesting pen to see. Um, only slightly more than the uh, the other 88 Flexes have been. So we're gonna get a few of those in. Um, and then I got some more secret projects that are in the works that are yet to come. I can't talk about them yet, but they're gonna be pretty exciting. So be on the lookout for those keep up with our newsletter. We're getting into the season now where things are gonna start happening really quickly and it's gonna be an exciting time to be involved in the fountain pen world. All right, before I get into the questions, I'm gonna take a quick break and go grab my water, which I left on the other side of the room. So hang tight and I'll be right back. Much better. Okay. Let's get into some questions, shall we? These are all like pen and writing questions and I got like one person on one business at the end, but <clears throat> I'm gonna try not to go as long as I did last week. I really was on a roll. But anyway, who knows? You just never know. I try to, I try to bullet these things out ahead of time, but sometimes I just really get on a roll. Here we go. Starting out with Mito N on Facebook. What do you think the next fountain pen trend will be? Well, I've never really been one to predict trends. I'm not a, a fashionista or a fashionista. I don't know if fashionista is a female feminine term or a dude term or what, but whatever it is, I'm not one of those. 
Um, I'm not a really great you know, predictor of the future, I just kind of do my thing. But um, I got some thoughts, so I'll go ahead and, and share out a little bit. I, I do think that just in general, that the fountain pen community probably moves a little bit slower in terms of like trending and all that kind of stuff uh, than other retail industries probably. Um, I think we just, you know, it's not like there's hot things every season and it comes and goes in a blaze. And, you know, I think the trends that you see tend to be more of like a five year, 10 year period. And then in retrospect, you can be like, oh yeah, that was kind of a trend. Uh, it's not so much like these, these huge waves of demand come in certain areas of the fountain pen. So it's, it's very nuanced, it's very subtle. Uh, but even still, I'll just kind of tell you my, my thoughts are just in general, because I find it to be an interesting question. Um, I could see more manufacturers going towards smaller batches. Um, of things. Not necessarily like high-end limited edition stuff. There's definitely been phases of the fountain pen uh, community's lifetime that uh, that's been a really hot thing. You know, I think specifically like in the 90s, maybe early 2000s, the high-end LEs was hot. A uh, little less so now. Now you're into a little bit more affordable pens. Um, so uh, I would, I, I'm seeing more, you know, seasonal editions, special editions, things where, you know, because there's so much transition happening between brick and mortar and online and, you know, just the e-commerce landscape is changing a lot, even kind of just on a yearly basis, uh, as I can say, being in the fountain, you know, fountain pen e-commerce world. Um, that uh, manufacturers who've been around for 70, 80, 90 years, you know, this period or the last 10 or 15 years have changed things so rapidly, it's a little more rapid than I think them and their grand lifespan of decades and decades and decades, it's changing a little faster than they're kind of used to. So I think, you know, there's a little bit of hesitancy, a little bit of fear on some of the manufacturers' parts to go all in on like these years long investments in research and development on certain models because it's so questionable as to where the future holds for fountain pens uh, in general, but then just in, especially in terms of like trending and what's going to be popular and whatnot. Um, of course, every manufacturer would love to come out with something that uh, is going to be a long-lasting, multi-decade, you know, staple model, um, you know, kind of a tent pole for the brand. Uh, but you just never know when that's going to actually happen. So. I'm seeing uh, more manufacturers are going to test things in kind of small batches. I see that. Um, certainly, we, there are some brands that are more nimble than others. Um, and you may look around and be like, man, why are these models are just churning and they're coming and going and all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of that is just, you know, it's what gets people excited. You know, newer people that are coming and going into the fountain pen industry, they're kind of getting into certain models. And then, you know, if they've got if they've got some legs to them, they'll stick around for a while. You know, I think about a pen like the Visconti Homo Sapiens, right? That pen was introduced eight or nine years ago. I'm not 100% sure the exact time it was introduced, but um, you know, it's become a staple in the brand, right? And they come out with special editions of that pen, um, but the Lava one is just, you know, it's a long-standing staple. Every pen company would love to come out with a pen like that. So they come out with some, and depending on how overwhelmingly popular it is, it might stick around for a bit. But I think I see a lot more pen companies moving towards kind of testing in those small batches. So I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes a thing especially with like seasonal stuff having more like bolder colors and patterns and stuff like that I'm seeing that as a trend it's a little bit riskier of a move especially with the larger the brand is the riskier the move is coming out with something more bold because you know specifically you think about certain colors like yellows and oranges and greens if you get those wrong man they really fall flat if you get them right people go freaking crazy so uh, it's just a really interesting thing and to see where it where it's popular in the world too um, you know specifically I was talking with the folks at Aurora and uh, at Kenro the US distributor for Aurora and you know just kind of globally like the different colors like the Aurora 88 uh, flex that they came out with they came out with a bunch of different colors you know a blue red green yellow brown and all these different colors and for us like like the blue ones disappeared the red ones went relatively fast you know and then it's like the brown you know and the green just kind of really stuck around well apparently like the brown and green like blue in Asia, you know, because they're more earth tones and that's more in demand over there. And it's just like, you never know what's going to come and go in different parts. And that's where it gets really confusing as a manufacturer to try and understand globally, like where demand is going to be. So I see, you know, um, you know, that being an important thing for them. And, and just uh, in general, I think the willingness to take, take a little more risk 
uh, on the manufacturer's parts. And I think having, again, again, going towards that smaller batch size, you can take a little bit more risk as long as you have the nimbleness of being able to change a product and, and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that uh, you know there's a lot more just testing in general that's going on. Testing and learning and trying uh, that's going on. Um, another trend that I would like to see more of, I don't know if it will actually be more because it's a lot to coordinate, but um, having more ink that coincides with pen launches. You know, specifically I think of Lamy, you know, with the, um, the special editions that they come out with, um, you know, like the Petrol, the Dark Lilac, and those kind of things. Um, you know, the Copper Orange, the ones that have been, uh, you know, even more successful than they probably even realized of coming out with the ink along with the pen, especially if it's a really good ink color like Dark Lilac. You know, it's like I could see that as being something that would be more popular. I'm certainly gonna encourage all our companies to do that more if they can. And then something that I really want to encourage to have happen to see, it'll be interesting to see if it happens, is coming out with more affordable pens. I still am a firm believer, and if you come out with affordable pens that draws uh, people into the hobby, that makes it accessible for everybody to kind of try out and really just find out how amazing this fountain pen hobby is. Uh, but that one's trickier to pan out because that kind of goes to the opposite effect of what I was talking about of small batches and testing and stuff like that is typically in order to get a truly affordable pen, you have to produce it in large quantities and then that takes out some of the um, nimbleness of it because you get super involved, especially if you have something that's like an injection molded plastic pen. Just the molds that it takes to make say like a platinum preppy. Now I'm not specifically that pen, I don't know how much their stuff costs, but from what I've been told about just an injection mold that it takes can, can be like a quarter million dollars to get one mold done for one pen. You know, and it's like you have to make different molds for every variation of pen there is. It, it's just, it racks up really quick. And as a manufacturer, to pay all that back, you gotta sell gobs and gobs of three and four and five dollar pens, right? So that's why you don't see super affordable pens coming out very frequently is because it's a huge investment in order to make it happen. And then typically when you do, you end up in a situation that's kind of like, you know, brands that are coming out of China like Jinhao and Wing Sung and, and Hero and some of these other ones um, where they may not be necessarily manufacturing, but they might be, you know, investing in a mold or, or buying a certain group of pens, but that are getting get sold or distributed to other brands around the world too, right? So. Um, you see a lot more like kind of copycatting going on with these super affordable pens just because you know economies of scale for one brand to sell back a mold like that is, is really difficult. So it gets really interesting but I, I would love to see more affordable pens kind of coming out um, and it'll be interesting to see how that can really play out. Cool? All right, I think that about covers what I had to, what I had to say there. Next question I have is from Mike F. Very tactical question uh, on Facebook. Brian, is it possible to spray paint a nib? Spray paint, like aerosol can spray paint. Um, possible, yes. Um, you can spray paint anything. You know, I could spray paint my laptop. Is that gonna be good for it? No. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's a very extreme example, but uh, no, the, the truth is no, spray painting is not really gonna work for a nib because the paint itself is too thick. Um, and so it's gonna do a couple of things. First off, if there's any degree of um, flexibility to the nib at all, it's gonna just kill that because it's gonna put this big thick coating on it and it's gonna really drastically change the, the writing quality of the nib. Um, but more importantly than that, uh, first off, I don't think it's gonna stick very well because you got these shiny glossy nibs and then you go and spray paint on top of that, the paint's not even gonna stick on it very well. So it's gonna look pretty terrible pretty quick um, and just scratch and scrape right off of there um, and not be very durable at all. Um, but also, it's going to literally coat and cover the entire nib. It's going to fill in. It's going to like seep into the slit on the nib and block your flow. I just, I don't think it's the way to go. Um, when you're dealing with nibs that have any type of coating to them, you know, for example, if you have a gold nib but it has a rhodium plated coating, right, like the Pilot Falcon or something like that. Um, the way that that's achieved is it's literally, you know, yellow gold that you are electroplating a coating on top of it. That's how that is accomplished. It's a super thin, like molecules thin coating that is, for lack of a better term, fused onto that gold. So um, it's gonna be very durable, but it's very, very thin, and it's very kind of uh, much on the surface, so it doesn't affect the overall weight or durability or 
um, you know, performance factor of that nib. Now, it can a little bit. I've been told, um, you know, I know that Aurora is going to be coming out with um, a, a rhodium version of their flex nib on some future pens that are coming out that are kind of yet to be released. Um, and they said that they had to tweak some things a little bit in terms of how they did the, um, the adding the flex to the nib because when they plated the rhodium on there, it actually changed the flexibility, the stiffness of the nib uh, to the point where they actually had to make some adjustments to it. So it's interesting, even, even that thin of electroplating can make a difference. Um, other platings that you have are like black, uh, like either a PVD, black oxide, or ruthenium. Um, those are all different kind of darkening uh, methods that you can do that all have their pros and cons. Um, but those are, they're all basically like pretty advanced methods of coating a nib that are beyond what you and I are capable of doing unless you're like, I don't know, in like gunsmithing or something and then you're like bluing gun barrels. Maybe you have the equipment to be able to do that. Um, that's basically what black oxide is. Um, but other than that, you're just not really going to have the tools to be able to do it. Um, and I think you're best off just kind of leaving the nibs as they are. Cool? Maybe not the answer you wanted to hear, but that's what I got for you. All right, next question is from Nick Conkling on Instagram. In the pen community, we often seem to talk about quality control only if it's poor. Flipping this on its head, what brand would you praise for excellent QC? Could you give an example of a company that typically sells pens under $100 and another typically over $100 that you feel deserves praise on the nib QC? Thank you. Well, uh, I think this gives us a nod back to the question that I had last week about the Visconti nibs and the Gulet QA 180, uh, 88, no, 87, 88. Which one was it? I can't remember. I wrote down 87, but I thought it was last week, which would have been 88. Dang. Anyway. Um, so uh, I think, yes, people have a tendency to want to spread negative information more than positive. You know, if somebody cuts you off on the way to work, you are way more likely to tell a story about that person that cut you off than you are about the probably 40 other people that use their turn signal appropriately and merged without any drama. It's just human nature, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff sticks out more in our mind. Not only that, but when you deal with online stuff, especially expensive pens and things that people are very passionate about, when there's negative stuff, especially people that don't have any experience with that, tend to want to share and spread that. It's kind of like an online gossip, right? And what's the harm? Who cares? You know, it's like it's all anonymous and all that kind of stuff. When any degree of anonymity that you have only just kind of makes that spread even a little further. It's human nature. It's not really to fault anybody, but um, you know, I, I, I'm glad you asked this question because it does shed some light onto maybe some of the brands that uh, you know just uh, you know don't. Well, I'm not going to say don't get talked about because a lot of the, the brands with good QC do get talked about for good reason. Um, but uh, it does tend to get overshadowed, not you know, not nearly to the degree as brands that have negative things going on. So, um, so let's see here. I think there's no question that the Japanese brands. Uh, are, are phenomenal in terms of their quality. Um, I think it's woven deep into their culture and uh, they take it very, very seriously. Whenever there's any type of quality concern that I bring up to any of our Japanese brands, it's like I have to make sure that I know exactly what the heck I'm talking about because they will investigate and they will take it very seriously and, uh, and, and it helps me in communicating to them to have all my ducks in a row. You know, if there's any type of QC issue uh, with Pilot or Platinum or anybody, you know, I don't deal with Sailor anymore, um, but I'm sure they are the same way. Um, they take that stuff very, very seriously. Um, so, you know, Pilot specifically, I'll say their QC is phenomenal. It's not perfect, um, but given the amount of pens they produce, it's pretty amazing. Um, they cover a full range of prices. So you got into your question of like the over under $100 here. Um, I think especially their pens that are under $100 is, is truly impressive as to their quality control. Because when you get into pens like the Metropolitan um, and the Kakuno and stuff like that, certainly when you get into you know having to produce a pen of that quality at that scale, uh, it would certainly le lend an opportunity to sacrifice on quality control, um, especially on the nibs, but uh, that really is just not the case very much. I hear about things here and there more often more often than not, I think what I end up seeing with pens like the Metropolitan, where their people are like, oh, the times are misaligned, this thing's right scratchy. A lot of times, 
Um, it has been in the past where people just have not filled them or not been aware of when they've run out, especially you know when the pens are coming with um, the squeeze converter. Now they're starting to come with Con 40s, the clear you know piston converters. But when they were coming just with the other ones, a lot of times they would start to run out of ink and people would press on them, tap them, stuff like that. So it would be kind of inadvertent uh, user error that would cause some of these issues. Um, that was a lot of what we saw around here that was happening, especially newer people that get into it. It's a very affordable pen. That tends to happen a little bit more with affordable pens. True QC issues get a little bit harder to separate out from just not having enough ink in the pen and stuff like that. So that's where you got to be careful about kind of separating that stuff out there. But um, uh, it is it is based on my experience and the number of pens that, like that that we've seen come through here. It's pretty amazing the quality that we've seen. I've always been very impressed with that. Um, platinum also deserves a nod, especially for the Platinum Preppy. That is a super affordable pen. The quality is fantastic. You run into you hear about some things of like some cracking issues and stuff like that, durability stuff here and there. You know, yeah, it's a definitely a less affordable. It's a it's a um, you know, it's a it's a more affordable pen, so you're going to run into some durability things here and there. But again, given the number of pens that are out there, it's it's not nearly an issue like you would think it would be. Um, I think German brands also take consistency and quality very seriously. I know that is the case. Lamy is pretty dang consistent. I think they do get some flack on some of their steel nibs, especially like the extra fines, because there's a small percentage of them uh, from their overall pens that end up dealing with some line variation and things like that, and some people that have uh, different expectations about how they should write. So um, I think they deserve a tip of the hat, um, but I know that there are some feelings out there about that, so I don't want to just brush that aside. Um, but in general, especially in terms of like the actual pen quality and stuff like that, pretty dang awesome. Um, and when you consider what these pens cost, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and then Pelican, I think, deserves uh, high marks for quality too, especially in the higher price ranges. Um, you know, I don't deal a lot with their lower price pens. We've tried carrying them here and there, and the quality's always been good. Uh, but I think some of their higher end pens, the quality is what they're really known for. Um, you pay a premium for it. Uh, you pay on the upper end for the Pelican pens, but you're always getting a really good product too. Um, and then, you know, going back to Pilot, talking especially Pilot and Namiki has to get a mention in the upper you know range uh, over a hundred dollars for sure especially like you know the vanishing point and stuff is really good quality but when you get into those namiki makiers and stuff like that there's no question those are some of the best pen the best made pens in the world um, because of the attention that they get and how seriously they take their quality so that's uh that's what i think deserves the most recognition uh based on your parameters of the question all right katie hello on twitter asks, what kind of fine nib pen is good for beginners? Uh, it's a good question. I get a lot of kind of like beginner questions every week and I always feel bad because it's like, I don't want to answer the same questions every week, but at the same time, I don't want to like not answer these questions because newer people that get into the hobby didn't watch Q&A five Q&As ago. So you're not as much of aware, but at the same time, you know, I'm trying to keep it fresh. Anyway, um, so what kind of specifically fine nib pen is good for beginners? You know, obviously I have to talk about my you know, five, top five fountain pens for newbies. That's exactly why I made that video is because it's such a great um, resource for new people getting into it. So check that out on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but uh, it's, it's really not um, that much of a deviation away from that video that I'm gonna get to, but there's a couple of medium nibs in there that, that are in the video that I'm gonna, you know, maybe steer away from a little bit, like Jin Hao and stuff like that. When Pilot Varsity, those are medium nibs. So I'm not gonna get into that, but my chair is really squeaky, I'm just realizing too. I'll have to pick a different chair next time. Sorry very stream of conscious thinker here, as you can tell. Um, so I think for beginners, what's important, and especially because you're asking about fine nibs, going with something that's on the finer side and something that puts down a little less ink is usually ideal. Because when you're switching over, you're used to dealing with probably inkjet paper because you're just grabbing copy paper out of the printer at work, or you're dealing with legal pads or something, some other you know college type, college ruled loose leaf paper, something like that where it's usually not the best paper and it's okay for pencils and ball points. Um, with ball points and roller balls and stuff, it's actually better to have paper that's got a little bit of traction to it because that actually helps the ball to roll a little more smoothly. When you get really slick paper, like Rhodia, Clairefontaine, stuff like that, um, it can actually not, not be as ideal for some of those uh, cheaper ball points and stuff. Um, but of course it makes your fountain pens feel freaking amazing. Um, but uh, you're not, fully like bought into that stuff right when you first get into fountain pens it's like it's like enough to get into the pens and ink and paper is usually kind of the last thing that people want to want to invest in but um 
Uh, that's why uh, usually fine nibs are better for beginners is because that's more uh, rougher, cheaper, more absorbent paper um, will just absorb up more of your ink. So if you go with a fatter nib, it's gonna dump more on there and it's just not gonna look as good. It's gonna bleed through, it's gonna feather uh, and all that. So you want something that puts down a little bit less ink. None of these are gonna be a huge shocker because I pretty much already told you the video, the top ends for newbies. Um, they all have great fine nibs for beginners. So, you know, like the Pilot Metropolitan, it's a fantastic pen. I love that fine nib, especially because it's a Japanese fine, so it's ground even a little finer um, than just about all the other fines. Um, another one that's the exact same nib but different pen is the Pilot Kakuno. So you can check that one out too. It's got a little smiley face on the nib. It's really fun. Um, the Platinum Preppy Fine for sure is a very worthy pen. That one they even have an extra fine, which is really fine. So you can check that one out too. You pay an extra buck for it, but it's very worth it um, if that's what you're going for. Um, have to plug myself a little bit here, my brand. Um, the Goulet fine nibs are pretty great. They're German made Yovo nibs, so a little bit fatter than the Japanese fines, but um, we're really proud of them. We check them all. They're great quality control. Um, you can fit them on a Jinhao or a Nudlu's Ahab or something else that takes a number six nib. Those are both great uh, starter pens and very worthy. And then I think the Lamy Safari fine too. You know, I'm a fan of the Lamy extra fine steel nib. You know, there gets a little more variability in the line width with the extra fine. I think it's worth the risk personally. Risk. It's worth the, the chance that you might get one that's slightly fatter because then you're getting something that's a little closer to a fine anyway. Um, but it it's, uh, could be well worth it for you. So those are my recommendations. Again, nothing like mind-blowing, but all really, really solid pens are going to give you great experience into the fountain pen hobby. All right, and then kind of keeping with the starter thing here. What's the best start? Oh, sorry. The Flame Deluge on Instagram. What's the best starter fancy pen? <laughs> starter fancy pen. So this one is very much open to interpretation for me. It depends what you consider fancy, I guess. Um, personally, I don't really, I, I'm gonna say, don't really worry too much about the fanciness of your pen um, when you're first starting out. And I don't say that because I don't think fancy pens are cool or exciting. I say that because pretty much when you're first starting out, every fountain pen seems fancy. I'm not joking, like I break out a Pilot Metropolitan, plain black, nothing super crazy going on, or a Pilot Varsity, preppy, anything like that. And people see that nib and they start writing with it and immediately that pen is fancy. Like it doesn't have to have a lot of embellishments on it and crazy acrylics and translucents and power of double vac fillers and all this kind of stuff. That stuff is like, can't even, doesn't even compute with most people. <laughs> Most people just starting out, just a fountain pen that works is fancy, right? So that's why I say like, don't get too obsessed with the fancy thing right off the bat. I think literally any fountain pen that writes half decent is gonna be fancy looking, feeling uh, more than most people have used of any pen. Um, for more, slightly more seasoned pen folks, so say it's not like you're just getting handed a fountain pen for the first time and you're like, what is this thing? You know, but you're like, you, okay, you've got a pen, you're kind of bought and sold on the concept. You wanna get into it a little bit, but you're newer to the hobby. Okay, that's, that's kind of where I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of assume your question is coming from because you're submitting a question, you're obviously enough in it to be involved here, right? So um, I would say, um, you know, I'm gonna consider for slightly more seed and pen folk uh, to consider fancy meaning more, slightly more of the aesthetics of the pen than just the fountain penness of it. Uh, just the fact that it is a fountain pen, but a little bit more to the aesthetics, some visual appeal, some slightly larger size maybe, or something cool in the design. Um, so I got a few pens that just kind of came top of mind to me. Um, the Conklin Duragraph and the All American, both sub $100 pens. Duragraph is nice in there in the, like that $50 range. Um, you know, you, you're getting cast resin materials here instead of injection molded plastic. So you get a lot of depth of material, kind of a classic vintage design that just doesn't look like most other pens that are out today. Um, like something you would find, you know, on the, on the office supply shelf. Um, slightly larger pens, some vibrant colors. I think they're uh, worth a look. Uh, the Lamy Lux, really any of the Lamy's, Fari All Stars, but definitely the Lux um, lends itself more to kind of that fanciness. It's got very much that like Apple iPhone kind of clean look to it. Um, Twisby, really any of them, but the VAC 700R or the 580 have a little kind of a polished look, the faceted design, some cool components that you can see how they operate. I think the fancy factor goes up quite a bit with those. Uh, the Monteverdi and Vincia, you get some carbon fiber in there, some different trim materials and stuff. 
cool looking pens, I would say they qualify. Um, the Pilot Vanishing Point, basically any of them, but if you want to go nuts, the Rodden Galaxy. <laughs> Probably out of starter range here, but uh, really the vanishing point, you know, it's 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 maybe a little bit outside the most of starter, starter pen range, but it's not crazy for everybody, so it's it's worth a mention because it is kind of an intro um, gold nib pen range. Uh, really, any of the Edison pens, I think any of them would fit in there. Again, it's a bit more of an investment. You're in that vanishing point price range into the 150 to 180 range there, um, but really any anything Edison kind of fits in there. You get into some of the same appeal that the Conklin Duragraph and All American have those cast mirrors and materials. Um, this one's American made, the Edison. Um, you get some cool different designs and, and lots of fun materials. Um, the Visconti Rembrandt or the Van Gogh, neat materials themed after the paintings from Van, from, uh, Van Gogh and Rembrandt. Uh, so I definitely think those go in there Italian made so you get some cool embellishments there. Um, and then, you know, I threw the Lamy 2000 in here. I know it gets a little pricey as well as some of these, and, and I'm and I'm kind of worked my way up in the price range as I've gone along here, as you can tell. Um, I'm like aging you up in the in the fountain pen experience as we go along in the question. Uh, but the Lamy 2000, it's a different kind of fancy. You know, it's more that Bauhaus, that industrial kind of clean look uh, that some people, I would say it's more of that fancy minimalist kind of thing, which maybe that is uh, just a, a, a paradox in and of itself, but you know, what the hey, I'm gonna go with that. So that's what I would say is, is uh, Lummi 2000 to finish you off for that question. All right, uh, let's get into a personal question here. This is from Daniel D on Facebook. I really enjoyed your breakdown of the Namiki Emperor Toriumon. In the video, you handled the pen with white gloves since the pen is so expensive and was on loan to you from Pilot USA. So my question is, if you owned this pen or one of similar value, again, this is a $12,000 pen, would you ever ink it up and write with it? Personally, I could not imagine buying a pen just to sit in a box or a display case since even pens that double as works of art, like this Emperor, are still functioning writing instruments. If the answer to the question is no, what's your most expensive pen that you could see yourself using? Okay, long question, Daniel, but thank you. It's a really good one, and that's why I wanted to answer it. Um, so for me, I would 100% ink it up. I would not consider buying a pen that I could not ink up. That's just me. Like, I am into fountain pens because I like to use them. I think they are tools. I think they're tools that can accomplish a couple of different tasks. They can be works of art, but they're functional works of art, you know, it's, it would be, to me, it would be equivalent to buying a Stradivarius violin and not wanting to play it because it's a really expensive violin. It's made to be played, like it's made to be used, like that's how I view it. You know, you don't buy a Steinway piano and just say, this is a really fancy expensive piano, I'm just going to sit it here and just look at it. You know, no, I mean, yes, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that, like really. And some people, you know, they get into it, they're collectors and they like to do that and that's their thing. That's, that's totally cool. Like, believe me, I would love nothing more than if you wanted to buy a Toriumon from me and just stick it away and not use it, that's totally cool. No judgment here. For me, I mean, this is a personal question, so for me, I would not be able to do that. Like, I literally have no limit to a pen, if I'm willing to buy the pen personally and have it in my collection, I'm willing to use it. That's just where I stand. You know, so I'm kind of more in line with you, Daniel. Um, you know, case in point here, I have a Homo Sapiens London Fog. They don't make these anymore. It was a limited edition. There's only so many of them. If I am going along and I drop this pen off a cliff or in a sewer and I cannot recover it, it's gone forever. Like, I will not have it anymore. There's an inherent risk to that in terms of a pen that's relatively fancy. It's a thousand dollar pen, relatively fancy. Um, and uh, yes, somewhat, somewhat irreplaceable, especially this number that I have here. What is this? 13 out of 888. Pretty cool. So I'm gonna go take my pen because everybody knows now it's number 13. <laughs> but uh, that's my pen and uh, I use it. I have it inked up right now um, with diamine uh, Regency Blue. And uh, I like it, and I use it, and I, uh, I enjoy it. And that to me is kind of the second half of the experience. If I have it on a shelf and I look at it and it's nice and it's fancy, I'm like, that's cool, but I'm a very tactile person personally, and that's to me is like, I just want to use it. And I know from having talked to 
the folks at Pilot, and, and uh, I have not talked directly with any of these Namiki artists who use these, um, uh, you know, who make these incredible pens, uh, but I know from talking to those who talk to them uh, that they would love nothing more, nothing more than to know that the pen that they have been working on for four to six months is actually being carried around in someone's pocket and being used on a daily basis because they make these pens to be written with and to be functional pieces of art. So it brings them incredible joy to know that people are actually writing with them and using them. Of course, they appreciate when people just kind of sit there and enjoy them, but you know, they're, they're instruments and they're made to be played, written with, whatever, what do you want to call it? But um, that's me, I've used, I've used literally with rare exception, I've used every single pen that I have in my collection, um, if not even just for a limited time. And that's just where I'm at. All right, I'm gonna finish this out with a business question. Let me take a sip of water first. How am I doing? 45 minutes, all right, not bad. That's good, we'll be under an hour today, I think. Unless I go for more than 15 minutes on one question. I have been known to do that, but probably not today. All right, last question is a business question. This is from a sketch stack on Instagram. I have a business question. What are some reasons you've decided not to carry a product? In the past, we've heard about complicated business relationships that eventually sour, but are there other reasons? Not enough room in your warehouse, trying to avoid redundancy in your offerings, concern about vendor supply, as in they won't be able to provide enough to match sales volume, et cetera. Or to put the question in another way, you're really asking me a lot of questions here, sketch. Um, why doesn't the Goulet Pen Company carry every single pen, ink, and paper product under the sun? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mix up my own order here and say, I'm just gonna go right to the punchline and say, you would not want me to carry every single pen, paper, and ink product under the sun. You wouldn't, because it would be completely overwhelming. A lot of the products would not be relevant and meaningful to you um, because there are just so many, so many out there. I'm not even joking, there's so many. Um, especially when you consider like regional, you know, country, you know, like specific things. There's so many, like literally pick one brand, like Clairefontaine, you know, and I just use that as an example because I've seen their full catalog Claire Fontaine's full catalog is like a telephone book. If you remember what those are, if you're young, you may not remember what those are, but there was a time when there was a physical book that was published. I think they still have them, they still give them to me. I'm like, what the heck? Why are they wasting all this paper? Anyway, <laughs> tangent. Um, this is how I go because it's a 15 minute question. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's seriously, they have something like 9,600 products in the Clairefontaine catalog. This is not counting Rhodia or any, this is literally just Clairefontaine products, 9,600 products. That's entirely overwhelming. When you consider every single brand that you even think to hear about has, okay, maybe not that many, but has a ton of products that you really have no interest in whatsoever. So if we carried all of that, it would be impossible to navigate our site. It would be entirely overwhelming and you would not have a clue what's going on and it would be too much. It would just be too much. You know, it's like we, we think theoretically having more options is better. We don't really want more options. We want more of the things that we actually want. We don't want a ton of options of things we don't want, which sounds very logical. Of course, I only want the things that I want to see. But no, you, if you talk about offering everything, it's just not going to work like that. So um, in the grand scheme of things, Goulet Pens, we're just we're one retailer. Like we're one retailer among tens, if not hundreds of thousands of retailers in the world. Yeah, like not, not, and I'm talking like just pen, like pen office supply, like retailers. Like there's obviously like way more than just hundreds of thousands. There's millions and tens of millions of retailers across the whole world, probably. I don't know firm numbers on all this and completely making this up. But my point is we're just one retailer and no one retailer can offer everything that maybe Amazon's getting there, but um, nobody can have everything of any of any model. So um, let me go back to my notes now, de-scatter my brain a little bit here. So um, I have kind of talked about this question before in terms of why do you decide to carry something? How do you make a decision to carry something? Stuff like that. So I'm not gonna approach it so much in that way, but you specifically flipped it around and said, why don't you carry it? The number one thing that goes through my mind and my team's mind when we're considering carrying a product, and we talk about this 
really on a daily basis, but we specifically have meetings every single week that are specifically geared towards new product strategy, right? We call it our new product strategic meeting. Imagine that. Very creative branding that I've done here, but uh, anyway, we have this meeting. We literally just had it earlier today for an hour and a half. Bunch of our leadership team, everybody who's relevant um, and, and uh, has a hand in what products we carry meets. Um, it's a team of like six or six or seven of us. We meet and we talk about what, our what feedback our teams have been getting, what's the pulse, you know, products, vendor relationships. We have some products where literally people like mail me something and it's like, here's this random thing, some dude in his garage, never heard of the brand, anything like that, handmade note cards, whatever it is, should we carry this thing? We may talk about that. We may have, you know, pen cases from Lamy or something like that. <laughs> That's an example I had uh, today. And uh, so other things might be like, hey, we have this opportunity to do these polishing cloths. Okay, and we talk, you know, about pricing and branding and all this kind of stuff. We talk about all that stuff in these meetings. But the number one thing that comes up with me and my team about this uh, is demand. Is there demand from our customers, not just in the world in theory in general, but from our customers who are actually going to buy these products, is there demand for these specific products? Because sometimes, I'll be honest with you, we think there's demand, and then we list something, and it's a huge flop. And we don't know why. Sometimes we have an idea why, but sometimes it's just a swing and a miss. And sometimes people get really excited, and there's a huge email notification list for it, and we list it, and it just falls completely flat. Usually we can analyze somewhat of why, but sometimes we have no clue. So we have a lot of discussion about what makes some products successful, other ones not, and so on and so forth. Um, but I can tell you that it's way more chance of a flop than having a smashing success for any new product that we're looking to launch at our company. So we have a lot, we have to be very intentional about what it is that we decide to carry because um, we have limited resources in terms of money, in terms of not so much space in our warehouse anymore. You mentioned that as one of your questions. We just moved, so we just expanded. Before, that was somewhat of, a, somewhat of a concern. It's not infinite amount of space. It's gotta be stored somewhere. And there's logistics involved with all that, but that's, that's less of a concern. We're not gonna not carry something because it won't fit in our warehouse. Um, we may choose not to carry something because it's gonna make the shipping completely uneconomical or it's just, you know, if we were like gonna start selling pianos or something, we'd probably think twice about that because we don't have room to store pianos and that would be ridiculous. But um, generally speaking, pen stuff is pretty small and we can accommodate that. We're used to that stuff. So that's not so much of a concern. Um, avoiding redundancies in our offerings for sure uh, can be can be a concern sometimes. Um, that can be a concern even within, a, within one brand. Like that happens all the time. I think specifically of, you know, notebooks. You know, we look at notebooks and you think of like a, I'll use a Leuchtturm or a Rodi Rama or something like that, where they have 16 different color offerings. We have done in the past where it's like, you know, when we first came out with Rodi Rama, we offered the full range, 16 colors, you know, and uh, there's a concept called the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule that some of you may be familiar with if you've ever studied economics or business or anything like that. Um, but basically the rule is that, you know, basically in a lot of areas of life, there's an 80-20 rule with everything, which means that 80% of the meaningful whatever it is is gonna come from the top 20% of that thing. So you get 80 from your 20 and vice versa. So in this context here, 80% of the sales that we have here are gonna come from 20% of the products that we offer. Likewise, the, <laughs> the lower 80% of our sales uh, Sorry, the lower, the lower, sorry, I'm missing myself here. Low, <laughs> the lower 80% of all of our sales are only gonna make up 20% of what, what actually sells. Ours is a little bit more of like a 75-25 because we very intentionally pick up and drop things, you know, that aren't uh, selling. Um, but generally the 80-20 rule holds pretty strong. So that's why certain products you see are always available and there's, you know, they're talked about a lot. and, and that rule, it really transcends just retail. It transcends into a lot of different areas. Um, but think about it in terms of your own time management and um, your diet and exercise. It can actually, um, you know, it's like, uh, they can, it can actually, there's all kinds of books and stuff written about it. Blah, 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 read books. Um, but look it up, Pareto Principle, 80-20 rule. Um, and that, that holds pretty strong. So when you think about that in terms of that holding pretty true in terms of pretty much most any businesses, but ours too, um, only 20% uh, of the products that we carry here are going to make up 
80% of our sales. So that means that the other 80%, which make up a huge amount of money that really just kind of sits there, 80% of our products only make up 20% of our sales. Um, that's, that's a big deal. So when you think about when we're just looking to carry some random new product, just by the law of averages, <laughs> it's probably gonna fit into that lower 80% that's gonna make up the 20% of our sales. So we have all kinds of conversations about what's gonna fit kind of into that top 20%. Um, and we're, we're constantly reevaluating that and shifting things and that's why you'll see stuff come and go. And you know, it's not as seasonal as say like clothing or fashion or something like that, but there is a seasonal element to the products that we carry too. That's why you see some brands that just whew, kind of drop off the face of the earth. If they're not staying relevant, coming out with new stuff, they kind of get forgotten about and they kind of move around and shift around. And sometimes things will be really important and we'll keep a lot of stock of it. Other times it'll kind of fall away and we'll start to run out of stock and who knows. Um, but uh, you know, that, that has a lot to do with it. If we think that something is not going to be a strong seller, if there's not demand for it, then uh, that would kind of fall into that category. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think did I cover everything. I really went off my little script here. Um, so yes, it's really all about, it's all about supply and demand. There has to be a natural demand for the products that we carry. Um, we can't create demand. I was, I was in that business before <laughs> in the earliest stage of the Goulet pens when I was hand making pens out of wood, there was no demand for them. I thought I was going to create demand for them. And I was literally just cold calling and hard selling every single person that I sold every single pen to because there was no natural demand and interest in it. There was kind of a curiosity around it and I would be able to convince them that they should buy it, but literally every time it was a hard sell. And uh, that is exhausting. And it's uh, you can't really build a business off that. There has to be a natural demand and kind of a perpetual growth that can come off of that uh, in order for you to really spur a real business off of it. Um, so uh, demand, is just natural. The other half of that, which you kind of alluded to here, you know, concern about vendor supply, 100%, like that happens a lot. Um, it's not always a deal breaker. If there's enough demand for it, then yeah, supply, uh, if there's a shortage of supply, limited edition stuff, seasonal things, sometimes it'll still be worth it enough. But we do, excuse me, we do have to be intelligent about that. You know, if we have a really hot, you know, I think one example is like Leuchtturm came out with uh, an anniversary notebook that was like a German theme, you know, uh, notebook. And uh, they, they reached out to us and said, we are gonna be super limited, you can have 10. And I was like, 10 notebooks. Well, by the time we get it in, process it, photograph it, promote it, pack it, ship it, da da da, I was like, Sorry, it's, it's not even worth it for us to carry it. I hate to say that, but the amount of labor and time and effort and overhead that it would take for us to carry a new product like that, it's not worth it. We're gonna have way more people that are gonna be interested in that and not be able to get it. All we're gonna do is make people upset. So let's just not even get it on anybody's radar. If they're super interested on their own, they'll go and find it wherever they need to, but we don't need to go and bring awareness around this notebook because there's gonna be so few of them. Um, other things like, you know, Twisby and other brands where they're just, they're, they're somewhat limited in their capacity to produce, um, they're still able to provide us enough where it's still worth it and we get asked about it so much, it's like, well, let's get whatever we can and then give it out to the community. So that ends up, we'll kind of walk in a line sometimes and we end up having to make decisions about should we carry or should we not and it ends up being like on a per product basis. Um, other brands where it's like super, super small, people that are just starting up, literally people in their garage kind of thing, that are in a situation where they're getting into, um, you know, speculative kind of stuff and they reach out to us because we're kind of entrepreneurial and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, so I got a bleeding heart for trying to help people kind of make it, you know. Uh, but at the same time, like we've been, we've run into this situation where there's inadequate supply or they run into supply issues with their raw components and I'm having to change the product. We have to re-photograph it, re-educate the customers and it just becomes an exhausting process where they're not stable enough. Um, that becomes very difficult because to try to assess where they are in that situation, you end up going into like a full on like detective mode with any new retailer or a new supplier that you're getting with and, and that's basically what we do is is um, we know enough of what to ask now. So there's like literally somebody reaches out and we're really interested in a product. We're like, okay, detective mode. We ask them like 30 different questions that just like dive deep into their and they're probably like, what the heck? You know, but 
that's just what we need to know to know if it has legs because if it is successful and we believe that it has enough potential to really be something meaningful to you all in the community, they gotta be able to back that up with supply. Otherwise, um, it's just not gonna be good. If the quality's not there, you know, it's like they say, the saying goes, if you have good marketing on a bad product, all that's gonna do is let that many more people know how crappy your product is. <laughs> so you have gotta have a solid product with good distribution set up before you can really meet that demand. So you gotta, it's like a give and a take kind of thing. You gotta have the demand. You cannot, sell, it doesn't matter how good your product is, it doesn't matter how high quality or what your distribution is. If people don't want it, you're, you're done. You gotta have the demand there. If the demand is there, the supply has to be able to meet at least to a point to then be able to kind of live up to it. Otherwise, it's gonna be a deal breaker for us. So there you go. I didn't think that I could answer a 15 minute question, but I sure as heck did. So there you go, a nice little hour long Q&A for you. I'm glad you stuck with me to the end. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, I'm gonna leave you hanging with a question of the week that is just gonna be some raw intel again for me because man, the last couple of questions of the week, you guys have been really engaged in the comments and I've really appreciated and kind of getting in there and, and getting to see your feedback. So I'm gonna give you another one here. Um, I'm really curious to know, I'm in like full on thinking about the holidays because I gotta, I gotta think about that stuff and we've been thinking about what we're gonna order, what products we're gonna order to gear up for the holidays and stuff like that. So just something that would help me really a lot and I'm really curious to know, you know, I always think about the holidays being a time where people are giving more gifts, clearly. Uh, I think a lot of people are gifting to themselves for the holidays in the fountain pen community anyway. Um, there's some seasonality we have around the holidays, but it's not as drastic as probably other, other businesses. But uh, I'm curious to know for you, for you gift givers coming up in the holiday season here, um, what kind of fountain pen gifts do you like to give around the holidays? Uh, I'm really curious to know, and as specific as you care to be, you know, starter pens, pen and ink sets, you can name specific pen models, that'd be great. If you give me an idea, I have like past sales and my own hunches and stuff like that, but if you have specific stuff uh, in mind, that's only gonna help me and give me good stuff to talk about with my team um, as far as what we should be able to offer you for this coming holidays. It's not too late for us to be able to tweak some things and offer some package sets and deals and all that kind of stuff, so I don't know. The more of that stuff you, you uh, engage with us on, the, the better we can serve you. So that'll be my question of the week for this week. What kind of fountain pen gifts do you like to give around the holidays or receive around the holidays? Why not? Um, could be good. But uh, that's it for this week. I hope you had a good uh, week. I hope you enjoy. Uh, for those of you who are in the U.S., it's daylight savings this weekend. So don't forget to set your clocks, spring forward, fall back. Set your clocks back. Get an extra hour of sleep. Um, don't forget to do that on Sunday morning. And that's about it. You can check out some of the stuff that I talked about on GoodlayPens.com. Subscribe to all my stuff and right on.